Hello, today we're going to continue our discussion regarding the um, action potential and some of the proteins and channels involved. And we will begin by describing the voltage gated potassium channels. The experiments conducted by Hodgkins and Huxley indicated that uh, the falling phase of an action potential uh, was explained only partially by inactivation of G sodium. They also found actually a transient increase in a G potassium that basically functions to speed up the uh, negative membrane potential after the spike. Based on this observation, they proposed the existence of membrane potassium gates that, like sodium gates, open in response to depolarization of the membrane. But unlike sodium gates, the potassium gates do not immediately open up. It takes about, about one millisecond for them to open up. So in such a case, the potassium conductance serves to reset the membrane potential. Uh, and this is, uh, this is called, this, this is called um, a delayed rectifier. So it basically rectifies um, the membrane potential. Now we know that there are many different voltage gated potassium channels. Um, many of them open when the membrane is depolarized and for, uh, they basically stop further depolarization by giving calcium a path to leave the cell. The potassium channels that we know of, that we've char characterized, um, have very similar structures. The channel protein consists of four separate polypeptide subunits which come together to form a pore between them, like what we've seen with sodium channels. And again, just like uh, sodium channels, these channels are also sensitive to changes in the electric field across the membrane. And when the membrane is depolarized, the subunits are, uh, they, they twist into a shape that allows potassium to pass through the pore. At least that's the general consensus. And like I tend to do, I jumped ahead of myself. This slide uh, basically summarizes what I just said. There are many different types of voltage gated potassium channels. Uh, these channels, at least some of them open uh, when the membrane is depolarized and function to diminish uh, further depolarization by giving uh, potassium a path to leave the cell. Um, the known voltage-gated potassium channels have similar structures. There are four subunit systems that respond to depolarization of the membrane and open up the path for calcium for potassium to leave. Now, let's define what are the properties of an action potential. We, we, have, we are able to characterize several uh, fundamental properties. First one is, is the threshold. Uh, threshold would be the membrane potential, which is enough for voltage gadium sodium channels to open so that the uh, the relative ionic permeability of the membrane favors uh, sodium over potassium okay the rising phase obviously it's when the inside of the membrane has a negative electrical potential uh, there is a large um, 
driving force for sodium. So the sodium rushes into the cell through the open uh, sodium channels, causing the membrane to rapidly depolarize. Next is the overshoot. An overshoot is, um, is a result of relative permeability of the membrane that favors sodium. The membrane potential goes to the value close to E sodium, right? Remember, um, the, the, we, have, we have the value E sodium, which is greater than zero, zero millivolts. Yeah. Then we have the falling phase. This is a result of uh, two types of uh, channels contributing. First is the voltage-gated voltage -gated sodium channels inactivating. Second is the voltage-gating voltage potassium channels being activated, opening up. And there is a delay of that one millisecond that we talked about earlier. Um, the, there is a great driving force for potassium uh, when the membrane is, is strongly depolarized. Therefore, potassium rushes out of the cell through the open channels and therefore uh, causing the membrane to become negatively charged again or, or obtain a negative um, um, potential again. After the falling phase, we have an undershoot. The open voltage-gated potassium channels add to the resting potassium membrane potential. Now, at this stage, we have uh, very little sodium permeability. Therefore, the membrane potential is driven towards EK, e so equilibrium potential of uh, sodium, which causes hyperpolarization uh, relative to the resting membrane potential until the voltage gating potassium channels uh, become deactivated again. After that, another uh, important hallmark is the absolute refractory period. The absolute refractory period is when the sodium channels inactivate, when the membrane potential becomes strongly de depolarized, and this results in these channels being unable to activate again. Therefore, another action potential cannot be generated until the membrane potential uh, becomes sufficiently negative to de-inactivate the channels, basically uh, for the membrane potential to reset. So that's the absolute refractory period. But we also have a relative refractory period uh, this is when the membrane potential stays hyperpolarized until a voltage-gated potassium channel is open. Therefore, more depolarized current is required to bring the membrane potential to its threshold. Hmm. So th these are the, um, the key properties of an action potential. Now let's look at it from... Uh, a slightly uh, different perspective. Here we have our uh, modeled auction potential in which we have the rising phase, the falling phase, and we know that the rising phase is associated with sodium, falling phase associated with potassium. Now we know that we have more than one sodium channels and we have more than one potassium channel. So, and we also know that uh, these sodium and potassium channels, uh, they can open up at different times and have a different time frame in which they remain open. So in this case, we have, for example, the first channel that opens up quite uh, quickly and stays open for a prolonged time. And then we have another one that opens up later and it stays open a little bit. And then we have the third one that opens up immediately um, upon, upon activation. 
So the outflux of sodium ions altogether is this integrated uh, sum of all of uh, the sodium channels acting together. And that results in the rise phase. On the other end, we have the opening events of potassium channels. Now, potassium channels, they may open uh, during the rise phase also. But their contribu contributing uh, proportion in this case is very little. So it's the influx of, of sodium that is more prevalent at the very beginning. Over time, of course, more potassium channels open up. And again, they remain open at for different time domains. They open up at different times. And uh, in integrated in, in outflow of potassium looks something like this. But generally, altogether, it forms the fall fa falling phase. So once everything is integrated, uh, we have the net transmembrane current. So at this stage here, we have, of course, the hyperpolarization. It, it corresponds to still open potassium channels, but when everything closes, all the potassium, all, all the channels are closed, then the membrane potential goes back to its um, resting potential around 65 millivolts in this in at this point right now that we know about action potential the uh, events that are involved in action potential and the channels that are involved and in activation of these channels uh, from the previous lecture uh, we now need to look at the bigger picture and see how the information is actually conducted along the axon, how the information is transferred. So, as we have uh, stated already, it is important for the, uh, for the action potential be conducted down the axon without loss of signal. So it's a it's a feedback mechanism, uh, not unlike a, um, a fuse, if you will. Once it starts, uh, once it once one uh, one end is lit, it will continue uh, burning in one direction. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it cannot go into into uh, the reverse direction because there is nothing to burn there. In our case, in the case of neurons, it cannot go in that direction because the channels are inactivated. So when um, a patch of axon, axon membrane is depolarized sufficiently to reach a threshold, voltage-gated gated sodium channels open, an action potential is initiated. And this positive uh, charge spreads along the axon, depolarizing the adjacent membranes because adjacent uh, voltage-gated uh, sodium channels respond to this change and uh, open up. Uh, and this is, uh, this, this is how uh, an action potential would work uh, its, its way down an axon until it reaches the terminal and uh, many different things can happen there uh, such as synaptic transmission, release of uh, uh, chemicals, we will talk about that in the next uh, subsequent chapter, chapters. So the actual potential propagates in one direction, it does not go back. And, well, and as I just stated, this is stated, this is because the membrane um, just behind the action potential is in, is in uh, refractory due to inactivation of the sodium channels. And depending on where the action potential is originated, 
uh, it can propagate one way or another. The normal action potential, uh, well, shall we say, um, when an action potential is generated from the axon terminus, then that propagation would is is called um, orthodromic. So it is down the axon. However, uh, it, action potential can be generated by uh, depolarizing the other end of the axon. Therefore, that would propagate in an opposite direction. The, this backwards propagation um, that can be ex elicited experimentally also is called uh, antidronic propagation. It usually does not happen in a normal cell. It shouldn't. But uh, this is yet another... Um, supporting piece of information that uh, we have a refractory system that keeps the propagation of an action potential in one direction. So we have been able to calculate that the average velocity of an action potential is about 10 meters per second and uh, the length of action potential is 2 milliseconds. Um, so that's that's uh, I mean with that we can calculate it's not that um, difficult so if we have 10 meters per second if we multiply that by 2 times 10 to the third uh, to the minus third seconds right 2 milliseconds we get basically uh, a propagation of 2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters um, or it's 2 centimeters length of axon that 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 uh, basically propagation of, of um, action potential traveling at 2 um, meters per second for a single uh, action potential occurs in 2 centimeter length length of uh, an axon so we just talked about the velocity of propagation of action potential. Now let's look at some of the factors that may influence the velocity. So the velocity of action potential is the spread of the potential along the membrane. Now anything that basically flows, uh, water for example through a, a hose or action potential through a nerve, obey the same rules in which uh, the flow will take the path of least resistance. If we have a garden hose with a lot of holes in it, then some of the water would leak out and if there is a large hole, then the water would most likely go through that hole rather than through the um, hose. Same thing applies to the neuron. If uh, we have a narrow neuron with many um, pores, then we would see a slow propagation of um, action potential. And if we have a, a large neuron, uh, a, a large axon, sorry, then the propagation would be faster. Now, the further the current goes down an axon, the more directed it is, it has less leakage, therefore uh, the depolarization of the membrane is further extended ahead of the action, action potential, which results in speeding up of the action potential. So, there is a... Uh, a correlation between axon diameter and conductance velocity. Therefore, certain neural pathways that are especially important uh, 
have evolved to have large axons, such as, for example, the uh, the giant axon of a, uh, a squid. It is it is about one millimeter in diameter, which is quite large, and uh, it was thought to be part of the circulatory system initially. Um, so altogether, it is important to note that uh, the the axon size and the number of voltage gated channels in a membrane affect the axon excitation in such a way that small axon requires greater depolarization to reach action potential threshold and uh, therefore these axons are more sensitive to um, being blocked by let's say local anesthesia and I will post a little insert about anesthesia. There are, however, adaptations that aid in propagation of action potential. Well, it is true that uh, a fat axon is good for conducting um, action potential along the axon, but it also would take up a lot of room. Um, so if, if all our uh, axons were the size of uh, the giant squid oxon, then our heads would have been the size of a, a building. So, fortunately, uh, the vertebrates have evolved certain mechanisms to to aid in propagation of oxygen potential, and it is the development of myelin sheets. Myelin sheets are electrically neutral, non-conductive, and these are the results of uh, certain cells, certain glial cells that wrap around uh, the axon with their membrane, which has a lot of myelin in it. And these cells, there are two types, uh, Schwann cells in a peripheral nervous system and oligodendroglia in a central nervous system. So, going back to the analogy of leaky garden hose, this mechanism basically is similar to that of patching the, the hose with uh, duct tape. However, uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, these myelin sheets are not continuous. There are gaps between uh, two myelin sheets. Well, obviously, this is, this is intuitive because the myelin sheets are created by cells. So it is not continuous and there are gaps and these gaps are known as nodes of Ranvier. These gaps are actually quite rich in um, voltage -gated, gated sodium channels. So this gap, gaps of Ranvier, which could be somewhere between 0 0.2 to about 2 millimeters, if you imagine, if this is the axon and we have myelin sheets around them, we would have an accumulation of charge here. Um, accumulation of charge here that upon reaching a particular magnitude would jump from one node to another. So rather than the, the potential going sequentially, it actually jumps from one node to another, one node to another. And that significantly increases the directionality uh, and uh, the speed of action potential. And this, this, this kind of an, a conductance of, of uh, action potential from node to node uh, is known as saltatory conduction. It comes from a, a Latin uh, word that, that basically means to skip saltatory conduction. So here to show this visually, um, we have nodes of Ranbir here, which are rich in sodium channels. When the sodium channels open up, sodium rushes into the the axon, 
causes depolarization and up to an extent in which this depolarization causes a jump from a node to a node and this is um, and it, that in turn activates the subsequent well voltage gated sodium channels and propagates the action potential along the neuron so in conclusion the action action potential that we've been talking about thus far in this chapter are specific to axons. Um, generally, the membranes of dendrites and neurons, neural cell bodies, do not generate um, sodium-dependent action potential. Um, as such, they are not, um, they don't have too many voltage-gated gated sodium channels. Uh, so the only membranes that have sufficient voltage-gated sodium channels are said, said to have excitable membranes, which are found in um, axons. So where does this uh, action potential generate? Well, it generates uh, um, right where the, the soma ends and axon begins the axon hillock, um, so axon hillock would be right here, uh, and that area is also known as spike initiation zone. So this depolarization of uh, dendrites uh, causes the synaptic input from other neurons lead to the generation of action potential in um, axon hillock. In, in, uh, on the other hand, the sensory neurons, well, the, the action potential is not generated from the axon hillock because, um, well, it's a sensory neuron. The, the action potential generates at the sensory nerve endings, which in turn leads to sensory stimulation and uh, generation of action, action, action potential, then further um, propagates along the axon and um, further stimulates uh, either intraneuronal response like we've seen already, uh, we discussed, or it propagates and or it propagates to the brain to be interpreted as uh, pain. So now you can see that uh, what we've stated previously, that, that there are difference in, in differences in axons and dendrites, now it's obvious that these differences are even on a molecular uh, level, on a, on a cell membrane level, on a cell protein expression level, um, and it's in the differences of the ion channels, and all of these basically characterize the electrical properties of the neuron. And in conclusion, let's recapture what uh, we started talking about in the previous lecture. Uh, so what was it? The neuronal signal transmitted as, a, as a, an action potential action potential is self-perpetual, uh, it's uh, renewable, it's, uh, it keeps its amplitude, its, its duration throughout uh, the entire path. The magnitude is the same, it's only the rate of repetition and the uh, frequency, or rather the train of action potential that encodes the signal. We talked about an example of uh, puncture in the skin, which then uh, um, results in stretching of the nerves, certain nerves that are uh, sensitive to mechanical disturbances, which have channels that open upon stretching. Uh, stretching of sodium channels in turn results in uh, generation of action potential. And uh, action potential is propagated from the sensory neurons up 
uh, to the spinal cord. Um, and from there, it connects with interneurons, which can directly relay the information back to the leg to uh, allow retraction and also splits that information and conducts it uh, back to the brain uh, to be interpreted as, as, as pain. Because let's face it, pain is a, a good thing to have. It keeps us safe. So we will finish with this and we will begin with the synaptic, synaptic transmission with the next lecture uh, in chapter five. Thank you.